few days ago so okay so what are we looking at here just because we have people who are you know have built their own nfts uh down to people who like just learned about uh what nfts are or even who still don't know yet what nfts are right okay so, so these might... squares here are the nfts right the three apes that you see here this is so you're seeing my screen right now this is literally my second mm -hmm. yep team okay. open scene all right so hmm so should, i guess i should begin with like how do i possibly narrow down a collection that i choose would that make sense to, to start with i guess mm -hmm. yeah yeah all right so well, we're saying you have ether and you're just doing this as kind of a speculative thing right you're basically um trying to buy low sell high right or right so i'm jumping under price thing or right so i jump into these nft collections the same way i would jump into any altcoin right like generally you have bitcoin or ethereum and you might try to trade some of it for a smaller cap uh you know, altcoin or crypto that you think, you know, might might multiply or, you know, increase in value quicker than the Ethereum or Bitcoin that you're currently holding, right? So if you didn't think that these NFTs would go up in value quicker than your Ethereum, you probably wouldn't trade your Ethereum for them. Um, so, and, and obviously these have a very low supply, you know, five or 10,000 is generally in a collection. So it's relatively very small compared to the supply of say an altcoin. So that's what kind of interests me in this is that it's a, it's a fairly low supply compared to probably the amount of demand that it may have one day. And currently like things, you know, for the most part, people are trading their Ethereum on OpenSea, maybe Maker's Place. There's like a few other NFT uh, marketplaces that you would go to trade your Ethereum. But the number one place that I go to- Trade your is, NFTs, you mean, right? To trade, yeah, to trade your Ethereum into NFTs would be OpenSea. It's yeah, generally yeah. where I go. <laughs> um, all right, so if I'm going to, so, so like if you want to just start in a general basis on OpenSea, they have up here, there's a stats section and you can go to rankings. And from here you would see the highest volume traded stocks in the past seven days, um, which you could change that to, you know, 30 days if you want to look mm -hmm. at like, you know, things that- It's probably... funny that you say stocks, right? Because these yeah. are like, collections and it was interesting because he showed kind of just the tool for making like just a single you can have just like a one for one someone called it right or you can have this a uh, collection of nfts where did i use the word stocks yeah you said i guess i did so i didn't even i didn't even realize that that was the term that i used in it but okay so i kind of like look i even say that for crypto sometimes like oh this stock but okay so here you can see in the last 30 days like crypto punks has been like the number one volume traded stock for a long time. And that's mostly because they have such a high price per, they're like a hundred ether or something plus per, per item. So generally they rank number one, but the last seven days is probably a pretty good uh, place to click in. Oh, there we go. Uh, probably a pretty good place to start with. So you can kind of see like what's been trending for the past week, but maybe not necessarily like the past day. Cause like what trends for a day can often change, you know, something could be in the top 10 for a day, but then all of a sudden be like higher, you know, like worse than 50 in rank as far as volume goes. Uh, so like recently the board ape collection has been trending really, really hard. Uh, and then the mutant ape, that was like a free airdrop that was given to the board ape yacht club members. And that one's at number two. Um, and then and just look at it. It's funny just to see right? The seven day change is plus 500%. The 24 hour change is minus 35%, right? It's just like crazy. Yeah. So the volatility the on these. Yeah. So uh, like it does, it does go down sometimes, right? If you got in 24 hours ago, you'd be down 35%, right? So it's all about the, the, time range that you're holding it really you know yeah so the volatility on these is like probably even more extreme than even like small cap altcoins for the most part so like this is your probably most extreme risky assets that you could be getting into more even more so than crypto in my opinion um and i've only been i've only been kind of digging around in nfts for the past couple months so i can't say like if this statement's 100 percent true or not but from what i've noticed 
in the past two months is that when Ethereum goes up, NFT goes, NFTs go down a lot. And then when, when the price of crypto or Ethereum stalls or goes down, it seems like the price of NFTs go up. And I would think that kind of makes sense because if you're looking at it just from a dollar perspective, you know, then when Ethereum's cheaper, that same one or two ETH item or NFT, you know, is cheaper. And when, and when the price of Ethereum goes up, that same one or two ETH is more expensive. So I think people kind of take that into account and then they they trade based on that. But then if, if you're already kind of aware of that, then people are going to want to start to dump NFTs or or go back in, into NFTs, you know, based on Ethereum going up or down if they've already kind of noticed that that correlation. But I, I'm not saying that's 100 percent true. That's just kind of what I've observed over the past two months is it seems to be uh, like an inverse correlation between uh, Ethereum price and NFT price. Mm hmm um so okay so i'll oh, go, ahead. go ahead i was just gonna ask is there any particular one of these collections that you especially like or how would you go about like narrowing that down okay so if you're not if you're not going into the whole minting thing right so if you're minting you're going to be you know getting a random item paying a low cost maybe it's 0 0.03 0 0.04 ethereum and uh you know in that case you're like you're doing your research into like the project ahead of time. You're going to their website, you're going to their discord, you're seeing how many members, maybe you're part of their discord, like a, a healthy project should have at least 10 or 20,000 members in their discord. And that's generally on the low end, you know, really, really popular ones that are going to sell out right away. Like all, all the items will be minted within a few minutes, or maybe you won't even have a chance to click buy, you know, because they sell out that quick. Those projects will have 50 to 100,000 members in their discord generally. Um, but if you say, say you're looking outside of minting and you're just in the secondary market, then I try to look at this, the stats over volume and choose something that's at least in the top 50 of volume, uh, but generally within the top 20. Uh, because then there's a, there's some history to it. You can get a sense of how the volume is fluctuating up or down. Um, and you don't, you know, it might not just go to zero, like where no one has any interest in it, which a lot of the NFTs I've bought, I probably can't ever get rid of at this point. New ones come out. There's a lot of attention on like successful projects or new projects coming out and some just get buried in the mix and it seems like people will never look at them again. So that's like kind of what I'm trying to avoid these days when I buy an NFT is I want to buy something somewhat established if I'm buying from the secondary market and not. Okay. Me. Kind of like the, uh, the, the largest market cap ones are sort of the same. Right. Yeah. And generally something that's like, uh, you know, an average for the past seven days so that it's something somewhat established. But, but then again, like that time frame it might just be a matter of context. So like, mm -hmm. if you're just going to pick up an NFT and try to drop it a day later, maybe you would want to look at the 24 hour volume and pick something that is trending for that day. But you then, but then it's higher risk because you're, mm -hmm. you're risking the and possibility even, of people forgetting about it within a few days and you're still holding your NFT. Um, okay, right, right. So, okay. So like, you don't so want to get it at the top right before it drops, right? Because sometimes it does it's a nice ramp going up and you think everything is good and then it just tanks. Yeah, yeah, it's easy to get caught up in like the, the you know, the extreme amount of hype on a, a particular project and think that it's always gonna be that way. And then a week from then, everyone doesn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I, I would say that a good way to start is to like look at a statistical chart like this and start scrolling through the volume and find something that's in your price range. So like. You know, board API club, huge volume. Yeah, but how many of us have 49 Ethereum, you know, to spend on the cheapest item in that collection? Not me personally. So I can't really look at that one. So then I start to scroll down and look at things that might be in my price range. Here we see like the sandbox. I've never looked at this one before, but it's third place in volume and and it's actually almost like half of where Mutant Ape uh, is. But anyway, so it's still pretty high up there. And it has a floor price of only 0.83 uh, Ethereum. But then you would want to say, okay, well, why is that so low? And then you look at the items and you realize, okay, there's 101,000 items in this collection. So it doesn't have the same scarcity, you know, that these other ones that have generally 10,000 or less uh, have. Mm -hmm. And then, so that would be something I take into consideration. First, the volume, then the floor price, and then finally, uh, well, not finally, but then, then, then how many items is a part of that? And then one of the signs that I look for for a healthy collection is that the owners 
to item number isn't extreme. So here you can see that over there's over 50% unique owners on the Board Ape Yacht Club. And I take that as a healthy sign because you're not gonna have some whale with 500 NFTs in the collection all of a sudden just liquidating what they have mm -hmm. you know, and dropping right. the price to an extreme. And that goes just like crypto, right? You would, you would wanna kind of know like how many unique wallets are owning and, and is there any wallet that's owning some substantial portion of this float. Hmm. Um, Interesting. There's some, actually people ask in the chat about Polygon. Is there any way to like filter this for things on Polygon or any of them on Polygon? Um, there probably is. Oh, oh here we go. All top. chains. And then you would go to Polygon. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that was a good question. I've never actually like dug into this that much. I tend I mean, to go to rarity. The volume is way lower, but it's interesting that I have this. Zed Run, right? That's the... Uh... Is, is interesting that Pol uh, I thought Decentraland would be up here. That's part of a Polygon thing, I guess. Yeah. I thought that was under... I think it wasn't under this. So they like moved at some point. So there's some. Let's see, they have it. They have it under ETH right here, Decentraland. Okay, maybe that's why. And there you can see the 97,000 items. Um. All right. Mm -hmm. So where do I go from here? We have our collections. We were discussing volume, floor price, items, and owners. Um. So okay. So once. Once I decide on a collection that I maybe want to dig into more, maybe I want to like think about buying an item from that collection. So let's, so, okay, let's just take this little baby ape club thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. This volume is pretty- By the way, are any of these actually related to the original board apes or they're just ripoffs that are trying to be like that? Well, so yeah, that's a good point. So like mutant ape is in fact like an airdrop from the original board ape yacht club and that's why their value is doing so well that's why they have it so if something there isn't already an established a collection and it did really well it's, been, it's doing currently really well and then they drop a new collection and let's say it's not an airdrop <laughs> generally okay. what's that well what about that little baby app i'm just looking laughing at what the people are saying in the chat little baby ape club so it's not that has nothing to do with the original creators <laughs> and I bought, dude, I, I, I bought one of those not knowing <laughs> that and then and then i kind of already knew there was a possibility that it it had nothing to do with it but i thought okay well another a bunch of other people might associate it with the success of these two projects and quite honestly i think that's the only reason it isn't number six is because people are saying okay it might have some association with these like whether it actually does or not like people still want to be like okay it replicates like a, a successful collection mm. wow 100 and i don't know how this percentage came about but that's crazy okay and what uh page is this exactly i don't see this, this was just, just a stat at the very oh, top the ranks when, there okay yeah like when you're on the main page you can just click stats um okay so what should i, I cool. maybe, so should i start digging into like maybe how do i maybe one that you can pay maybe like 0 0.3 0 0.5 ether for is there anywhere you could get something like so you want something with a low floor price <sighs> well i don't okay so you want me to just pick any random one at all wolf game wolf game okay so let me see if this is actually on rarity.tools and there's what 11,000 items we have. So see how this has 781 owners for an 11. Point okay, that's now. kind of red flag. So yeah, it's not like that right away. I would probably just like start looking for a new collection. I mean, maybe what about the lions? We could just do the lions because that's probably a good example, right? Yeah, that's going to have quite a bit higher floor price, but I could talk about those a little bit more. Okay. Oh boy, my internet's a bit slow here. Hold on. All right, so Lazy Lions currently ranked 24th in the seven day volume. This was one of the first collections that I had some good success with. I had hopped in to them when they were around like one and a half ETH floor price. And throughout like the course of a week, their floor price had gone up to 3.5. And then eventually, like within a couple of weeks, we had crashed back down to below one ETH. And now it seems like we're starting. So basically what happened was the ETH price was sitting pretty steady around two grand and we flew up to three and a half floor price on ETH. And then 
as mm -hmm. ETH started pumping up to 4K, this just started decreasing over the course of two weeks. And, we so, and it's like hard to know even sometimes if you're making money or not, because it's like, are you, are you valuing it in terms of how much ether you're making or are you thinking if you liquidate your whole position, you know, which you don't actually do when you sell it anyway, most of the time anyway, right? Yeah, so I guess there's there's definitely both types of uh, traders in this. I personally only care about the ETH value that's changing, not the dollar value. But I okay. obviously, so obviously, you're kind of bullish on ether in the long run, and so you're just kind of flipping NFTs in order to build up more ether. Yeah, my sole purpose is to gain more ETH. I'm not actually focused on the dollar value at all. Um, but obviously some people are so the price on... of ether as that fluctuates you don't really care when that crashes because you have your value in these nfts it's not just the erc20 uh, yeah yeah that's correct um all right so here we have lazy lions currently a floor price of one and a half ETH. you got four and a half seven thousand or yeah four point seven thousand owners so basically fifty percent owner to item uh ratio and you have good volume so now I'm going to jump over here to I guess my rarity. rarity.tools and up at the top of rarity.tools, there's an all collections, which once again, they'll show the seven day volume rank, but it'll be a little bit different because it doesn't have not everything on OpenSea is going to be on rarity.tools. So that's actually another uh, like thing that I look for when I'm, I'm choosing a collection is that I prefer to have something that is on rarity.tools because a lot of people who are going to, you know, purchase something may, may come here first, like myself, in order to kind of figure out the rank of a specific item within a collection. So, all right, I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to go to lazy lions. And so, the Sorry, first... so Michael, may I, Quick to interrupt. So it's yeah. very interesting. It's very interesting what you're presenting. I was wondering what is the um, sort of selection criteria in terms of rarity. So let's say I were to have a yeah. collection of ten items, and they're truly unique, and um, they they have some you know unique presence. No one else has it. And they're minted in a tease. How is that valued? Because some of the items that we've seen now have a lot of items, either literally sort of like the Warhols of their time who just kind of printed for everyone to have art. I feel like that's a little bit like that for some of the collections we've seen here today. Mm -hmm. um, what if you have a rare collection where you have, let's say, 10 limited items, and that's the end of that collection forever? Yes. So rarity is probably only going to be valued if the collection itself is valued as a whole. So if you could like some, there are people who are, they, they came from an art background and they uh -huh. do, they do release NFT collections where every item is a one of one. Um, right. And, and in that case, the whole collection might, you know, all be worth say one ETH or five ETH or whatever it is. Um, and maybe, maybe like any particular item isn't more or less rare than the others. They just all are coming from some kind of verified artist that, that holds, you know, a certain floor price on their collection. Um, but I guess ultimately, like the collection has to be respected itself in order for those rare items to be valued. Um, it, I guess it's easier to explain on a collection that doesn't, it isn't all one of ones, you know, something that has 10,000 items and, and has a, a variety of rarity from one to 10,000. That one is a little bit easier to assess, like, how you value based on rank. Um, and I guess, did, did that answer your question somewhat or do you wanna- Yeah, I'm trying to understand the pricing dynamics um, um, of all these different marketplaces. Um. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I think it please. might make sense to see like how they add up the different things to get the rarity. Do you want me to go through this rarity.tool thing to kind of show the process? Or I like or... the rarity.tools uh, little display they have, yeah. Okay. So this, you can sort it, right? So if we just look at the cheapest line, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'll go through my process of how I'm assessing mm -hmm. like the price of each rank. And then if you have a question, just feel free to like interrupt, jump, jump in and ask me. Um, okay. 
So first, like, so here we are on Lazy Lions, and I went over to this sort by, it automatically is on rarity, and I sort by price low to high. And here we see the floor price of 1.5 ETH, and you can see their actual rank value is up here in the top left corner, and their, their card number is here, but that's just their card number. The top here on rarity is going to be their actual rarity within the 10,000. Um, so the first thing you could spot is, okay, is there something like completely oh, under? Okay. Yeah. I actually wasn't really aware of that. So the lower number is like what number it was minted out of the 10,000. Right. And that has nothing. That's just a, that's just its ID number. Like it has nothing to do with rank. And so for the top number, the lower is better. Like number yeah, one. The lower, the yeah. The lower, rare. obviously one is your best. And some say this collection has 10,000, but there's, I believe like 10, items that are considered a one of one and those are all ranked number one mm. and then after that then it starts with rank 11 12 and on for things that actually had a randomized property uh creation which here like down here you can see your traits uh like your background how many items had this background or this background 305 of them have a blue background and it'll, you know, so this is, you can somewhat see like how rare of a particular property is amongst that, that trait. Um, like here you can see eyes, like 300 3D glasses and stuff. So you can kind of get a gist of how many there, how many of the items will have that particular property. Um, can, I, can I make a quick uh, comment on rarity? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, typically, at least for me, and I, I, I trade quite a, a lot of nfts but at least for me like typically rarity really matters if i'm minting um you know and and as you mentioned earlier and i'm getting it for you know typically under 0.1 east whatever that might be and then you're kind of randomly getting one of these items and so you can look up and and get very rare items a friend of mine got um a one of one um, doodle the other day and sold it or a week or two ago and was able to sell it for 80 ETH yesterday. Oh, um, so you can really, 80? yeah, yeah 80 ETH for, for a doodle. Uh, doodles. Doodles is the question. And, um, wow, but, that's man, yeah. How do you, you don't <laughs> mint it on OpenSea, right? It's like on their website. Yeah, so a lot, of, so yeah, the, the, most of these projects have their own website, um, and so you would mint off of their website. So yeah, he was able to just he just minted, um, I think he minted like four or five, and was able to get like one of the, I think it's like a top ten um, doodle, if, if not the rarest one, and you know sell it pretty high. But I, but what I found, and I have some pretty rare NFTs as well, unless you have like a really really rare one. Um, if you're buying like in secondary, going towards the floor, at least for me, is um, price ones are, are typically the better route to go. It gets really subjective on what the values are kind of with the mid tier. And so at least for me personally, I'll, I'll just try and find kind of the, the highest or I'm sorry, the lowest um, rarity one like in, right around like the floor price and then i know that anytime i need to sell it i can just sell it for the floor price without kind of needing to say oh you know what this is a little bit rare i need to get you know 20 30 percent over floor which you could potentially do but it can just take a lot more time and with some of these projects um they're not quite as liquid with some of those like middle rarity ones so just just wanted to kind of throw that out there yeah, that's that's an absolute perfect point to make. I 100% agree with that. So like liquidity is the big issue in NFTs. And this is an issue that I ran into is that I like digging around for something that's rare in a collection. And so I'll go on this rarity.tool site and I'll dig through a collection. And I might find something where maybe it's a rank of 100 or, or better. And um, and so then, you know, maybe that that particular item I find is is only priced at one ETH and everything else that's under is better than a rank of 200 is maybe priced at a rank or priced at two ETH or more. So I'm like, OK, great. I'm getting this, you know, thing at half the value of what other people are selling at. But then once I buy it, I like I, if the collection isn't doing that well, there is no buyer to buy that from me, even though it was an undervalued. I could still list it at 1.5 ETH and everyone else is two ETH or higher but no one ends up buying it. So then I'm just stuck with a, a worthless one ETH, you know, uh, 
NFT. So like that, that's, I guess the, when you're going to find a collection to begin with, like you need volume, you need liquidity. And then buying the floor price of things is going to, you know, buying a really cheap item is going to be easier to resell later. Cause there's very few people who might want that five or six ETH rare item in a, in a collection compared to the amount of people that are willing to buy something at the floor. So yeah, liquidity is key because if you can't get rid of it, then it doesn't really matter how cheap you got it. Um, yeah. So, okay. So here we have like lazy lions. I've, these are all the cheapest ones that are, are starting out and you could like start to look, okay, is there anything that's like much under, uh, you know, underpriced compared to the thing next to it? But you can see that this is pretty close. 1.53, 1.55, 1.6. It's a pretty thin floor actually up to 1.7. It's only about 15 NFTs before we would be at 1.7, assuming that other people aren't going to start listing in. Um, obviously, like, so if you have the, if the collection is selling quicker than people are listing, then that's how you get the floor to rise. And if the floor kind of sits still and no one buys this one, then maybe someone else layers underneath and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you're kind so of, maybe that's that three, I was just going to say, like, if you look around and see, like, are there any especially rare ones within this floor, right? Like, I guess that three, one, two, seven, uh, the guy with what? the bunny ears. Yeah, right? so that would be the rarest one out of these top 12. Right. So I was just going to get into that. So like, so say there's no major discrepancy between the pricing on the floor, then you could start to look at the rank and say, well, okay, of the ones that are between 1.5 to 1.7 ETH, which, which is the lowest I, I have here in rank. And so that, so one way you can actually do that is you can say, okay, like you take a scroll through and you're like, okay, it takes you know, about this many to get to 1.85 ETH. So this first page goes to 1.85. So if you put in the, and under price, a max price of 1.8 ETH and hit apply, and then go over here to the sort by and change it to rarity. Now it's going to show you the most rare item you could get for 1.8 ETH. And then you can see that this 1984 one is pretty significantly under the rest. Like there's nothing even in the 2000 rank here and it jumps to 3000 rank and then goes from there. Um, so like this one might be a somewhat undervalued NFT given its rank and its price. Generally, I don't do it that way though. Generally, I go by rank. I do the sort by lowest to high, and then maybe, so this one has a, a collection size of 10,000. So maybe I wanna see what the top 10% are going for. And so I'll take note of the floor price at 1.5 and then I'll hit apply and let's, and then I see kind of, you know, what are the ones that are ranked a thousand or better going for? So they're going for 2.2 and up. And, and from here, then I look for another discrepancy. If this first one was ranked or priced at two ETH and then the next thing was 2.5 ETH, I might actually consider buying that first one just because there's a half ETH gap there. I could even try to reprice it the same day for 2.3 ETH because I'm still the cheapest. And maybe if it's, you know, even cheaper than the next. So this one's ranked 969. So this, you know, say these were priced at 2 and 2.5 ETH, this 735 could probably be repriced at 2.3. And it's still more rare than the next cheapest one. And it's, it's priced less than that. So that might be like a quick flip. Um, and that's kind of how I look for it. But then, so then I'll start narrowing it down more. I'll be like, okay, let's see what the top 500 prices are. And you can see that like, this is a pretty thin floor after 413 and 415 are gone, you're up to three ETH. So then that might be, you know, an opportunity to buy one of the cheapest ones of that rank and then reprice it to, to something, you know, a little bit higher, but still less than what the others are going for. I mean, generally a perfect situation is where you have a, uh, the first one that whatever's the cheapest one in a particular rank range is is it's the cheapest one where there's a discrepancy and then it's also still a lower rank than the next next priced up one so that would be like a pretty good scenario where you have a discrepancy and it's a lower rank or a better rank however you want to say it and then that's kind of what i look for with the lazy lions this is a pretty established collection so there's not a lot of huge discrepancies that you're probably going to find um, but they sometimes do exist like i'm going to try to find one here it will apply to three rank of 300. Still Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is there any way, uh, like how we, you have a rarity tool, is there any way to sort by what the smart contracts do? Mm, 
I'm not sure I know understand the question. Do you understand that, James? So um, I, yeah, smart Our contracts answer. have smart contracts are essentially features that are added in the NFTs, correct? The smart contract has added features into the contract. Well, kind of. I mean, you need a uh, smart contract just to create NFTs that do nothing in a sense, you know. But there are other, oh. you know, like rare um, Decentraland wearables are NFTs that also, quote unquote, have a purpose, right? Like you can wear them in the game. So, oh, right. So, yeah. I'm once not sure if that's that. what you meant. Yeah, I think he's basically saying is there more is 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 mm -hmm. can you value but NFTs smart based contract, on utility? Yeah, like in a way, it's kind of a misnomer, you know. It's just like the code of solidity they call a smart contract. It's not necessarily adding uh, extra smart features and AI and things like that. You were know? were you understood? Asking, were you asking about like assessing value based on utility of the NFT? Was that kind of the gist of the question? Also. Also, yes, but um, I think a better question I should reframe it as would, um, could you explain smart contracts um, and their possibilities in an NFT? I mean, because I heard multiple uses for them as from basic, from basically getting them started to offering some kind of in real life offering, right? You're hearing people getting into concerts or parties using their, their NFTs or having exclusive rights to things in the real world. Are we... Could you all like, explain on all the possibilities that you're aware of of smart contracts and how they work so I can maybe understand that a little better? Yeah. I think that would be a better question. Yeah, so that would go back to probably like assessing the collection as a whole. And assessing the collection is going to be a lot to do with going to their website. Like, number one, they should have a website, that like a dedicated website to mm -hmm. the collection. And like if you jump to the Lazy Lions website, they yeah, do like have a little kind of like paywall type of things where like if you have a lazy lion then you can access this special page you know right so, so right mm -hmm. right now i would say that like nfts like they're supposed to be the contract is supposed to have utility that's kind of like the whole point of it but right now they're kind of like trying really hard to make up reasons why you should own the, the nft like it's kind of like um oh yeah it's not because like because that really everyone makes fun it. of it that it's just a worthless image in the cloud but then you add all these extra perks on it and it's like oh suddenly this is like not totally worthless right they're trying to present themselves as more than just a jpeg um and so like if, if any collection has any utility at all then it could be a reason to buy that nft versus another collection so most of them are trying to promise some sort of metaverse or some sort of future game that you will then have a character or avatar that plays within that thing. Um, and then like, so Board Ape Yacht Club, like they literally have parties in New York and, and like wherever, you know, like for their members. So yeah, that, that would all go into trying to assess about the value of a particular collection. Um, and so where you would figure out like what, what that NFT will mean for the future would be their roadmap. So once you go to their website and you'll see, you know, kind of a timeline of what they plan to accomplish and, and maybe how they, they plan to accomplish it. Um, and that, that would be, I guess, something that you dig into when you're first trying to figure out what collection to be a part of. You hear about something, you can go to its website read over their roadmap what do they have planned in store for this collection and and would that be a reason that people might get interested and start buying into into that particular collection mm -hmm. um and also like games right like nfts are also for games so like zed run for example the horses are nfts and then in the game you can race your horses against other people you know you can breed your horses and make baby ones right or yeah. Decentraland, you can own wait, 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 the wait. land. Pause real, real quick. Can you expand mm -hmm. on that one more one more time? Say that again. Yeah. Can uh, here I'll post the or you could just go if you could real quick, Mike. In well, the browser, maybe. What do you it's want me to go Z to? Dot, Z dot run is the URL. Okay. And this is a game, right? It's just in the browser here. And so there's racing, breeding, a marketplace, and the horses themselves are NFTs. So you can buy and sell your horses, 
just like you would buy and sell horses in real life, right? And wow, yeah, I would awesome. definitely suggest joining the Discord of any collection that you are thinking about being a part of because you'll get a real quick sense of what the community is like. If like there's a lot of discords where people are just nonstop arguing in the chat over what the direction is supposed to be, why are why is the floor price dropping? Like what, you know, or, or it'll just be like technical errors. Maybe it was supposed to be minted on a particular day and they had some technical issues and they're like, oh we'll we'll do it a week from today and so forth. So you'll get kind of like all the insider information of what problems are happening or what kind of issues they're dealing with, how positive or negative is the community. Um, so like Discord is a wealth of information when it comes to kind of sensing like the energy of a collection and how much hype or, you know, whatever is going into it. Um, and that's, that's kind of, I found one of the best ways to kind of figure out if it's something that people are going to like, or it's something that's kind of going to die off with 99% of the other collections out there. Because we are getting to a point, it's almost like how like altcoins became super hot at one point. Everyone wanted to be a part of every altcoin that came out. And now people are kind of cautious because they realize like over 90% of those projects like never get talked about again after a couple of weeks. So NFTs kind of has a similar trend to it, it seems. Yeah. But this Thank one is just so awesome. Questions. Look, these are actual horses racing right now, right? This is a race happening and people own horses. and then. The top three get paid out and yeah have you have you started to do this at all james like have you bought any horses and raced yeah yeah i mean i honestly haven't been racing them that much i bought them more for like breeding and just kind of holding as like speculation that the game will get more popular i also really like that it's on polygon right the nfts are on polygon and uh, the like entering into a race, you use Polygon Ether. So you pay almost no gas other than the transfer to move it into your la layer two, you know? So does, when they race, is it, is the winner chosen by the stats of each horse or is it randomized or how do they determine like- Yeah, so there's a, like a Z number, I'm trying to think if you go to like, um, maybe if we scroll up. There. And then do what? You want me to switch this over to your screen? Um, yeah, I could, well. Or do, maybe you do it, I don't even know how to use Zoom. Um, Hold on, because I'm on my phone. I'm not sitting at my computer, but I had joined on my phone, so I can, I can join in here too. But um, it's basically like a Z number, right? So each horse has a number, and the lower is better, right? So Z1 were the ones that they gave out when they first released the game. And when you breed two horses, right, you breed a male and a female, and you add the Z number of each of those two together. I think it's like genotype or something they call it. And so you have a, a Z3 male and a Z2 female, and you know that it will make a Z5 baby, right? You don't necessarily know if it will be male or female. Um, but And so it's like, a, there's like a little bit of randomness in it there's also like a breed so like nakamoto is like the really rare like purebred and then sabo is like level two and then there's some other ones right so that kind of factors into it and then there's a little bit of randomness also right mm -hmm. and uh then so they you, just kind of play it out the simulation is actually built in uh elixir right i was actually um was going to apply to work here at one point, but then I just got distracted and they're based in Australia, right? And I kind of like working at Aeon anyway, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And you can what, you can assess the rarity and, and whatnot 
of your horse from knowyourhorse.com. Is that? Mm -hmm. So you can use it. I've never seen this website before, but I just heard about it. Whoa, so. I haven't seen it look like this before. Maybe I'm not on the right one. I literally just typed in knowyourhorse.com, but maybe it's, is it different than that one? Uh, mm, I don't think this might, this might actually be a, like an actual racehorse <laughs> website, not the Zed Run one. Type into Google, just Google know your horse. It might be know your horses, plural. Know your horse, Zed. Yeah, it's horses. Know your horses dot com. Okay. And so this is basically like rarity.tools for Zed Run, from what I understand. I've never been to this website before, but mm -hmm. I just put out it yesterday. There's also, um, oh, I'm forgetting it right now. Do any of you guys remember McKay or Ken? What so, was what do you, so if you win a race, what is the reward? Right. Do they pay out ether or? Mm hmm Yeah. It shows. They pay out uh, if you go into racing, you can see the different races. And then what? See. Standings, results, events? Well, winning. just go to events and see, like, the ones that you could enter into. I mean, this right, is so kind of cool. Of it's literally like a parallel to, you know, real life, as in that, like, you could buy a horse, you know, one with really good stats to both make money from racing, but also because you could resell it for more later. So this yeah. one has dual utility. So the thing is, though, like, it's tough because they kind of take, like, a rake, right? So even if you just assume that it's, like, totally random, you know, and you have like a one in 12 chance of winning each prize. Um, like you, it's kind of negative expected value, right? Because they pay out less than they take in all of the... Where does the ETH come from? Each person is putting up a certain amount of ETH to participate? Yeah, you have to pay. I mean, these are all free races. If you click on that like class class five button and that's why it says prize pool not available these are just fun races i guess i don't know why no, none of these have prizes click on like class four at the top see those little bubbles oh okay class four. okay so oh. see some of these that have a prize pool have an entry fee also now how does that work with if you if you pay your entry fee is there a gas fee involved with that or do you like transfer a like a certain amount over to an a account. little bit less than they take in the in the entry fee which i always thought it would be cool if they had like you know um what i think mckay was saying it should be sponsored by like woodford reserve or something right and then they put in an extra 50 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever into the pot Oh, you know, that's a good, like, advertisers, like, yeah, would, would fund the prize pool, you know, even if it's a small amount, like, five bucks, ten bucks on each one, that would be a good way to, like, use this platform for advertising. Yeah, but it does look, like, really clean right now, you know, it's just the table, like, entry fee, prize pool, take it or leave it, you know, that's it. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't. And there were actually some races. I don't know what the NA, what's the deal with that, but there were like three races with a three dollar prize pool, you know, so you could just enter your horse. And uh, it also just builds up that horse's stats, you know, so if it gets in first, you're also getting that first place on your stats for other people to see. Oh, okay. So that would be the incentive to like do free races is that you're increasing your stats. Mm hmm. And it, it's like somewhat just luck. So especially if you have, you buy a really cheap horse that just has like one last place finish and that's it, you know, it's like, you could just, you might as well just roll the dice and try to get something more than that stats, right? Yeah. Like if you got first place in one race, now it's a totally different horse in a way from the, from the potential buyer's perspective, you know? interesting it's almost seems like something that like people play like fantasy football or like those type of things would be into because it's like so stat related mm -hmm. i heard we have a board ape holder in this chat is that person here no <laughs> i have two 
Do you have two of them? So when did you get yours? Right. How long ago? I, I minted um, four of them. And then um, <laughs> crazy, craziest thing is at this point, I've owned eight of them um, wow. and sold my last one when for like seven ETH. <laughs> and then literally the next week, they shot up to like 18 ETH and then came back down to 15 and then, you know, kind of rocketed to where they are now. So at this mm-hmm. point, I'm kind of um, just holding. Um, but but yeah, it's uh, I kind of wish I never sold any of them, but it is what it is. And I've kind of reinvested that into other projects and everything. So it's worked out but did you say yeah, you it's been a great ride them and then you bought two back or you you got rid of your last one and you still had two like yeah you were always yeah there. so i so i had i i minted four and then funny enough so like the next day i sold one of them for like 0.18 or something like that and i was like yeah i doubled my money you know <laughs> and it was all excited and then uh, i held the other three and then i actually bought the two i have now for um half an ethereum each and then i've since um you know bought like another one or two and then sold off the other three that i minted and so yeah the last one i sold was the the third eight that i that i had three at that point so yeah down to two right now and um don't see myself uh selling anytime soon at this point yeah i feel like those they're always worth holding at least one because it's like i swear those board apes are like bitcoin for the nft or maybe ethereum i guess pick yeah. whatever the cyberpunks or whatever that top one was um is like bitcoin and i feel like board api club is the ethereum of the nft world yeah and it, it, it's interesting too because yeah crypto punks is the, is the kind of the originator from back in 2018 for these pfp projects but you know they didn't they didn't give any of the holders like ip rights or anything like that and and the board apes did and so you know kind of kind of like a lot of people talk about um east flipping bitcoin there's more and more people that are like hey you know the apes are providing more utility um you know you have ip rights all these other little things and so there's a lot of people actually tracking um you know, kind of the the board eight flipping on a day to day basis. It's kind of funny, actually. Yeah, they got their momentum going, and it doesn't seem like it's slowing down. I mean, it's just like it's got to a point where celebrities are now holding them as if it's like a a hyper car or something, right? Like an mm-hmm. in a club that only certain. It's funny because someone, uh, my one friend, sorry, but uh, he just asked, was like had no idea what NFTs are and he asked me about the board apes right like that was the one collection that he knew about yeah it's uh I wish I could afford a board ape at this point but <laughs> when I saw them for 11 ETH I thought they were pricey and then I got into lazy lions because they were down at like an ETH or two but man I wish I had actually just bought an ape did you get a uh were, were the mutant apes were the, was that part of a free airdrop or what was that so what the, what they did with the mutant apes, they everybody that had a board ape, you got a serum. So there were three possible serums you could get: a M1 serum, a M2 serum, or a mega serum. And so I think with that, there was like eight total mega serums, around seventy five hundred M1 serums, and about twenty five hundred M2 serums. So that was like ten thousand covering the same amount of board apes that they had and then they and then on top of that they sold another 10,000 just mutants that were already mutated with on on a dutch auction starting from i think like 3 east and i think they all sold out by the time it hit like 2.5 or a little bit above that um and so with the serums you can actually if you have a board ape use the serum on your board ape and then you'll get either an M1 mutant, an M2 mutant, or a mega mutant. So like right now, the the M, the M M1, I think the mutants, last time I looked, like they were, the floor on them was around like, I think six and a half or seven ETH. And then the M2s was like, I think 12. And then the mega mutants are like, <laughs> like two or 300 ETH. Um, oh. starting there is absolutely like anybody that got a mega serum it's just like they just essentially gave you like a million dollars excuse me real quick 
what is a theorem? Huh? I don't mean to be that right behind the ears, but what is a theorem? Like, are we talking about like using the Ethereum like for to boost their their or is it something separate like like Ethereum like the currency you're throwing at it to turn it into a mutiny? Where it I came with something serum. called he was saying no serum yeah serum like like uh, an injection it, almost it's like know? a Pokemon it's just, it's yeah, like it's rare Pokemon. candy to a Pokemon <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much like one the M ones look like a beaker with some like green stuff bubbling out of it. Um, the M2s was like um, hmm. kind of a larger beaker that had like an eyeball and some other stuff floating in it. And then the M3 was like a um, a barrel with like a toxic emblem on the outside of it. Um, so they were all NFTs in, in and of themselves. So with that airdrop, with the two mutants I, or the two board apes I have, you, cause they kind of did it randomly. I, I got um, an M1 um, serum and an M2 serum. So I, I, a lot of people have used them to mutate their mutants, but I've just been holding mine because right now the, the serums are the only deflationary thing um, in the whole board ape ecosystem. So, you know, my hope is that over time, you know, they, they go up in value more and okay. more. Because then um, they just get burned as people use them. Oh, that exactly. Was so smart. I didn't even think of it. Yeah, it's deflationary because everyone's using theirs. And if you don't use yours, you can sell that serum as a possibility, you know, later on. Right. And so, like, the M1 serums, they, they started at, like, 7,500 of them. I think they're under 3,000 left now. The M2 serum hmm. started at 2,500. There's less than 1,000 of them left now. And then with the mega serums, I think they're still four that haven't been used yet um so yeah it's it, it, it's interesting but that that's part of the thing the about the serums are the nfts also and so yeah they're their own NFTs, when you yeah. use the serum on an ape you get a mutated version of that ape yeah so what they did was essentially which which you know when we talk about utility you know they kind of really took their project to another level so you know, the board apes initially were a generative project where, you know, they had all of these individual generative traits, whether it's hats, you know, different eyes, different mouths, um, different clothes, different fur, all of this stuff. And so essentially they just made mutated versions like M1 and M2 mutated versions of all of the traits. And so when you use a serum on your ape, it just kind of re- it creates a brand new NFT off of your ape and just gives you all of the mutated traits for your individual ape. So one of oh, the big okay. things people have been So there's like one-to-one -one traits, like the yeah, so Super it's exactly, Mario it's, hat and the regular one goes to the mutated Super Mario hat. Exactly. So there's a lot of people that have been kind of talking about, you know, there being a sub gear of, of value down the line for people that have kind of the original ape and then the M1 and M2 mutants of their eight kind of as a three, okay. kind of a three package to sell those down like the line. Triple the, super collection. Exactly. And then the 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 mega um serums, those don't use any of the, the traits. Those are just eight, like one of one, just like super rare and, and cool looking mutants. So um, you know, if you have one of those, it just is something completely different than your ape. But with the other two, mm -hmm. it's it's directly off of the traits on your ape. Right. It's just like a new one of one, basically. Exactly. Exactly. And it's interesting because you know they they kind of were one of the first projects to really kind of give you a free airdrop and and do stuff for free. And and it's interesting because you look at a lot of projects now. And they are really following a lot of the same kind of steps like, hey, you know, sign up, um, you know, we'll we'll give you a free airdrop in a month and we'll do this and that where it's like kind of the very similar to the, the Apes original roadmap. Yeah. So is there actually a, a club on a yacht somewhere that we can go to? <laughs> So funny enough, they, um, not yet, but they did at um, NYC NFT, or I might have that backwards, um, how I said it, but um, they did do a yacht party 
Um, they had a warehouse party um, that most people that I didn't go, but I, I've heard from a number of people that were there that their the warehouse party they had was like the best event of the, the whole um, um, NYC NFT event. Um, when they they are using the money that they from the ten thousand apes that they minted, you know, in the Dutch Dutch auction, starting at three to build out some real world stuff. Um, like I think they're building out a club actually in Miami and, and some other places. They're and they're also actually really interesting, right? Sorry to cut you off there. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. Yeah. But just like the real life thing, right? Like there everyone talks about it. Oh yeah, tickets uh to actual real life events, right? And like Madison mm -hmm. Square Garden could accept NFTs, you know, as tickets. Um but I don't think anyone's really done it well yet. You know, there's still that weird thing of like, what if I sell my NFT and don't send you? I mean, with a ticket, I guess it's all kind of virtual. And that's why video game items, it works because that's all happening through like, you know, HTTP requests and things. Um, well, I know well the good thing is or, with um, yeah. NFTs in the, in the marketplaces is they're, they're really just relying on the smart contract. So, you know, they're, they're pretty much trustless um, in the marketplace. So it's like, if I, if I post um, one of my apes on OpenSea, for example, it's, it's verifying that it is an official ape when I post it, mm -hmm. you know? And so then sure, when right. somebody comes along and just buys it, they're just completing the smart contract. That NFT just pops up in their wallet, the ETH's in my wallet, and, you know, it's pretty much done. So, um, you know, I think things like tickets are going to be really cool. I mean, Ticketmaster and Live Nation have already announced that they're going heavy into NFTs for, you know, their concerts and sporting events um, in 2022. Um, the NFL announced that they're starting to do some NFT tickets actually this season. I saw something yesterday um, That's where cool. they're. So you yeah, kind of so, just get like um, MetaMask or Coinbase or something on your phone, and then you can just scan it at the door. You know, I think so. It's interesting because I, I kind of see it, NFTs in two paths right now. You definitely have the the Ethereum kind of MetaMask, and I and I I personally feel like you know, Ethereum is going to continue to be the core of NFTs, but I've seen a lot of kind of one-off companies like CNN has been coming out with their own NFTs. They're actually on the flow blockchain. Um, and they kind of use a completely different wallet. That's in some ways easier because it's, you know, it, it's not as I would say they want more information. So they want like an actual, you have to sign in with an actual like email address but for the average person um, or like a ticket master, I would think like a ticket master will probably have some sort of wallet on their platform that you could probably, if you're savvy enough, um, you know, transfer the NFTs out of, of ticket master. But I think, you know, one of the things now around NFTs is a lot of these major brands are trying to figure out a way to use the technology, but translate it to kind of the masses in a way that they're used to and accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Is anybody, yeah. um, has anybody purchased any NFTs using Polygon or any other? Um, as, talking about this made me think, you know, I see that it's up for, with Polygon and other currencies, but you see that the floor price is not nearly as high when you're looking at Polygon and those other ones, at least from my personal experience. Um, has anyone actually made any purchases using anything besides Ethereum for an NFT? Yeah. So I've, I've, I've used Solana, which I'll go to Solana art. So like Solana's uh, marketplace that I think is the most popular, maybe it's not, but is Solana art.io. And here it's very similar to OpenSea, but everything is purchased with Solana. They even have Degenerate Ape Academy, which is like your board ape yacht club for Solana. It's, it's in second place, often it's in first place. Um, I did dabble with these. The only problem is that like the biggest projects ever are only like like 40 Solana. So I don't know, what is that? Like eight grand or something like that. But like most of them are, you know, less than that. Let me try to find another one. 
Uh-huh. So this would be like a penny stock compared to the big chips. Yeah, because say you could you say you could gain like five Solana on a pretty established project, you're still only talking about like a grand of profit. Whereas like on OpenSea, if you're flipping something from two Ethereum to three Ethereum, you know, that's a yeah. lot more likely on a whole range of projects. And um that's and, awesome, actually. Could you do that, Mike? Actually, uh just open the pop up to see what would the gas price be to, if we wanted to buy one of these okay yeah i mean the, the, oh, it's the, pennies it's pennies on yeah, the reason i got involved with solana because the price is i ha- honestly haven't even seen this website so this is pretty interesting yeah so the well i'd have to connect my wallet to start buying it doesn't work on here it only works on my mm. other laptop. but um yeah, uh, yeah. The the gas price is almost nothing, and that's what interested me in trying to find Solana projects. But then ultimately, once I started digging through them, like the the change in price is not drastic enough to like really warrant all that. Like like looking into uh, it. getting greedy. It's not. Well, I mean, I yeah, I guess it might be worth it. Working smarter, not harder. Uh... They, they got, I guess the prices just don't change enough for me to be interested in them, but I'm sure someday, you know, like Solana projects will be a lot larger and maybe like getting involved in these. Right. It's almost like a long-term hold, but that's the thing is that like, uh, how do you know what will be like the popular things now might not be the popular things 10 years from now, right? I guess it's just such a, ric- a risky marketplace to be trying to think about long-term holds unless you're in one of those like legacy projects like a board ape or something like that mm-hmm. um but i mean i guess if you want to play that game like of long-term nfts you can either get very rich or lose all your money on it <laughs> right and then to the other one i've i've done solana and then also um polygon but it sounds but it seems to me like polygon so far the fees are way cheaper but it seems like the main projects I've really dealt with there are around gaming um, and play to earn gaming, like um, Zed Run that you were talking about earlier. There's another one um, mm-hmm. that I'm that I, I like um, called Riot Racers, which is kind of like Zed Run, um, but with car racing. Um, and mm-hmm. and you know, and they're doing that because the fees are so much smaller. If you were having to, you know, and and because there's so many transactions that have to take place. If you were doing it with ETH, you you know you'd be running through hundreds and thousands of dollars just to play the game. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it just opens the door so much to what you can do, right? And it's like gas just isn't a problem anymore. Yeah. Has anyone purchased anything from OpenSea using Polygon though? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I have. I purchased. That's how you purchase Zed Run horses, right? You have to use Polygon because they're all deployed on Polygon. Oh, so Zed Run horses are on OpenSea? Mm hmm. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Forgive me for asking novice questions, but if I don't ask, I, I won't know. So I just have to, you know, yeah. ask them no out worries. there. Yeah. 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 How I'm do sure you there's other people wondering, right? James, on OpenSea, is there a way to filter for only Polygon projects? uh yeah there's a chain somewhere if you scroll oh. down chains here we go polygon mm-hmm. yeah that's a good point can you check and see what the ceiling is on the polygon oh i think i need to not be a major one. so okay what was that question so i said that's a great point if you can sort it you'd be able to see what the ceiling is essentially on the polygon yeah for oh well, i'm not exactly James, I don't know if you want to switch over to your screen and sift through, or I, or you can instruct me on how to do it. But I don't. How would you just uh, click Explore? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, that should you could click like all NFTs or or whatever. And then now click Chains on the left hand side. You were just in yeah. Lazy Lion oh, before. That's why. Right, right. Like Polygon. And then you can do sort by. Um, I think it's. I think you would have to do sort by highest last sale maybe is there a way to view just as a list all the polygon projects like right now it's it's, it's all polygon items but is there a way to go to 
Like, um, possibly through the rankings stats. Yeah, the I mean, rankings I haven't done that. Done before. Oh, okay, stats, rankings. Oh, and this one built that before. Okay, this oh, there great. you go. There we go. And then you would look at Polygon's chain. So, okay, that's perfect. Yeah, so you want to save on gas fees. You still want to be on OpenSea. That would be how you would start to sift through Polygon volume. Oh, and even still, okay, yeah. So I have a cool thing to talk about, right? We were saying that, uh, right? I have, I, yeah, it's kind of hard for me to share it right now, but I had drawn on a whiteboard and I have an image of it, of like a chart, right? Imagine, a chart where like the y axis is price and the x axis is rarity, right? We also didn't show, show that on rarity.tools, right? How like each individual plate uh, trait is like plus so many points and then it adds up to the total rarity for that individual NFT. And so the idea is to basically get like a ratio of uh, the overall rarity for that nft divided by the current price you know and that kind of gives you like rarity per dollars you know so for every dollar that you're spending you want to get the most rarity that you can and to have some kind of uh script or something that either goes through rarity.tools or gets the data somehow and just crunches the numbers and like calculates that for every NFT in the collection. What every, I guess, one that's listed at a price, right? What's the price? What's the rarity? And it will just find um, the maximum rarity per dollar that you can spend. And the idea is that like those are somewhat undervalued. You know, like you're kind of assuming that generally the more rare something is, the more it, it should sell for, you know, like the, the value relative to everything else, you know, in the collection. And so you can find them that are underpriced and put them at a quote unquote fair price and then probably sell them or put them at a higher price and then make a little more profit or if you want to price them to sell quickly, right, you can put them at one that's still below your line of fair priceness, um, but still above what whatever you're paying for it, you know? So that was a cool thing, right? I'm a coder, so I'm always looking to code things. So if anyone wants to try to build that with me, I was just thinking it would be a cool thing. Yeah, that would basically would be like a shortcut to what you kind of have to do manually. Mm -hmm. Like there. automating what you're doing there, yeah, manually. Right. So like when I go to rarity.tools, I'm looking for that underpriced NFT within a certain range of rarity. And so if mm -hmm. you had a a chart with dots, you know, that's showing rate rank versus price, then you could spot that dot that's, you know, sitting lower on the chart for where it's place for rank. Um, another mm -hmm. tool that I use is that I click on the volume traded uh, box for a collection. And then I'll look at the volume and the average price to kind of see if it's in an uptrend. So like Bored Ape is pretty steady, um, but you can see that it has certain like peaks and whatnot. But right, right now you can see that. Oh, that's interesting. Wait, yeah. sorry, how did you get to this chart? So just like as soon as I clicked on the collection name, uh, you got your four boxes here where it's showing items, owners, floor price, and volume traded. I click on the mm -hmm. volume traded box. Oh, but then you're in activity, right? Not items. That or I guess you could also just click activity. And then yeah, you can kind of see that the board apes were pretty steady here below this line of 50 ETH. And now we've started to kind of break out of that and start to trend up. It's interesting, the big spikes there, you know, do you know what? And then to what look at the it? number of sales is important too. Like you can see that these are averaging like 60 to 100 sales a day. 
sometimes like you can see here it really was dying off kind of as the ethereum price was really doing well but then as soon as ethereum started going down we see this spike in volume and in price and in number sales so like to me that's something okay I've, right so this is the price in terms of ether right yeah like so if i saw this chart just kind of you know dwindling away down to the bottom right corner but i was still interested in that collection i'd be waiting for that that volume to kind of start turning up and going up because then i know that there's both volume and and obviously with volume and, and demand comes the increase in price so i think this card is pretty important to like look at so that you can see that the liquidity is going to you know keep improving well but at the same yeah, time this, case, right, this is um, uh this is like technical analysis, right? This is only telling you about the past, right? So well, yeah, the card leaves off there, forward. but you, what you care about is actually what's going to happen next, you know? Yeah, and because in this case, the reason why it, it kind of has spiked over the last week is because um, Jimmy Fallon bought an ape and then um, Post Malone um, mm. not only bought an eight, but he has a new music video with The Weeknd and he buys the eight, he actually buys the ape in the music video. I guess when they were shooting it is when he bought the ape. So um, that's brought a lot of excitement to kind of board ape over the last week or two. Yeah, it kind of times perfectly with the ether price dropping too. So it was kind of hard to figure out like, is it fundamental or is it like, you know the ETH price changing. Well, you think they dropped it so that Post Malone could get a cheap board ape? No, I'm saying that, like, you know, the fundamental analysis of like who is interested and what's going on with the project, so forth. Like those fundamentals improved at the same time that Ethereum price was dropping. So like i don't know if necessarily the price went up because of the hype surrounding it or or if that had something to do with the ether price dropping um or maybe it, it was a combination of both but i like i've been looking for a correlation between ETH price and nft price and so but i'd like i'm 100 percent certain if that is in fact the case that that just because ETH price goes up nft values go down or, or vice versa so I'm saying that like there was a lot of articles and news surrounding the Board Ape Club, but it also came out at the same time that ETH was dropping. So like it was hard for me to assess, was it one or the other or both? Mm -hmm. Have you noticed the same thing? Um, I don't know the name of the guy with the Board Ape, but have you noticed a correlation between ETH price and NFT price or no? Definitely, definitely. Um, I think NFTs is, is a whole, but I... I think it's just like kind of a new phase of, of sector rotation. You know, we, we kind of saw with just crypto in general, how kind of money would rotate, you know, kind of from alts into Bitcoin as it was pumping. And then, you know, we, we'd have alt season and all that stuff. So it, 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 to your point, I think as, um, you know, Bitcoin in particular and ETH are pumping, people are, are pulling out um and, and taking profits um on their nfts and then moving that over and then you know probably taking profits back on the crypto side and then reinvesting in in eth and then the other thing that a lot of people have been talking about kind of that's pumped a lot of nfts recently is kind of the ens airdrop um because that gave a lot of people you know a lot of liquidity out yeah, of the blue with the board um, ape also was part of that ens drop and then he immediately put those back into like mutant apes and i was like yeah hey, i wish i had some dot eth addresses because that was a nice drop that was like several thousand per address you own oh it was crazy <laughs> it was crazy yeah i've been trying to pick up on that like shift in like you know how they're going out of you know, like just how they go from big cap to small cap. And then now it seems like it's in and out from crypto to NFT. I'm trying to catch those waves back and forth because I had purchased a bunch of NFTs and then Ethereum went way up. And then I was stuck with, with the NFTs that I could not sell for the value I bought them at. But had I been, you know, in ETH when that price went up, I could have bought way more NFTs because their value dropped. So I'm hoping to kind of like catch that shift as it happens. Mm. And I have another 
question, kind of like a buzzkill technical question, but maybe not, but just like when you sell an NFT for Ethereum, that's not a taxable event, right? Because like Ethereum is not a recognized currency. It's just like trading a thing for a thing. No, it isn't. So anytime you're trading any crypto for any other thing, there it's a taxable event now. So whether you go from Bitcoin oh, to it is. NFT, NFT back to Ethereum, I mean, but you're doing it on your MetaMask. So like, that's up to you if you want to start putting that in your taxes, because it's not actually like viewable by them. But for everything that's happening on major exchanges like Coinbase, yeah, that's all a taxable. Mm. Event. Ethereum to Cardano is a taxable event. Wait a minute. Yeah. Hold on. Uh, sorry to break in, but um, what do you mean it's not a viewable thing? I mean, right now the IRS isn't probably <clears throat> looking too deeply in it, but it's on the blockchain, right? So they could look at the the price of the NFT that was last yeah, sold. Yeah, but your address, all yeah, but your address, address is, and your right, address isn't you necessarily it. connected to you. To your identity, yeah. So certain things are connected to your identity. The whole KYC rules, but right. Uh, with with your meta man, I mean, I'm not suggesting that you don't record those transactions <laughs> as part of your taxes. I'm just saying, no way, definitely you know, not. That's up to you because it is you don't have your identity as far as if you set it up right, your meta man shouldn't be connected to you. Your identity is assuming like what? I mean, know. there is no option. There's nothing to put identity into MetaMask if you wanted to, you know. Well, it's like, you know, if you did like tornado cash or something like that from the central of the exchange to some other, you know, MetaMask account, maybe. But otherwise, I mean, like if you're connected to a centralized account, uh, centralized exchange, you're connected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, theoretically, I don't know if the IRS has got their act together that much. They could figure it out. Well, but do you consider OpenSea you know, a centralized exchange? No, 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 I don't. I'm saying that, like, how'd you fund your MetaMask in the first place? Right. When you sent when you sent that transfer from your Coinbase, say. In I mean, sending that. money isn't a uh, something that you need to report, right? Well, if I it's gave yourself, someone thousand dollars. You don't dollars. report it if it's just someone else. You're supposed to record it. So I mean, it's a gray area. Um, but technically, yes, you're supposed to count that as a, as a taxable event. See, if you just did one. Let's say you sent one ETH to your MetaMask at some point and you've just grown that amount, then maybe, you know, it could just be like, hey, I, I bought something at that one that one time. But yeah, I think if if the funds are KYC'd and especially if you're using um that wallet to fund the MetaMask on a regular basis, it's a it's a pretty easy connection. But what if you were to lose your password to that MetaMask and it really wasn't yours at some point? Like you could, yeah. Pretend, I mean, you know, you really pretend that all everything that's happening on that one activity has nothing to do with you, like that that isn't you and it's not your identity. But yeah, I would probably say it should be. Yeah, right. but they could probably prove that it was you well, using you it back, once you, you do a transaction after that. After it's a you say that. to a centralized exchange. So if you make a bunch of ether on your MetaMask and then you want to cash out for dollars, then it's going to be really hard to cash that out right so, like you if you ever want to bring it back to your bank account you won't be able to but at the you know maybe sometime in the future you'll be able to go to a corner store and buy stuff with ether right you could just spend it all right or you could have someone pay you cash and then you just send them the ether from that account but then you have to deal with cash. Yeah, but then there's a paper trail back to them, right? The feds kidnap <laughs> them. <laughs> I guess we probably shouldn't discuss it. <laughs> Yeah. It's crazy though that it didn't used to be that way. Like you could do all the trades you want in crypto, and it wasn't until you went back to US dollar that it was a taxable event. Yeah. It makes it actually makes a huge difference because like if you got to pay your taxes on all that crypto, you like you may need to sell crypto just to pay it, and now you can't like keep appreciating your crypto. So it's kind of it does eat away at your profits when you have to transactions that are taxable mm. this will be the first year i actually find out about that because i've always just been like a long-term holder but now this past year has been like a ton of trading yeah i mean i feel like the whole market has just exploded this past year yeah so um 
back to the question that I think it was Michael had uh, about like, you know, Polygon or pretty much any of the chains, like I I've noticed it too, the, uh, the prices just are, or the floors are much smaller anywhere. I mean, yeah, Solana, Solana's hot. So yeah, I could see that being, you know, some opportunity there, but um, really like, is there, it sounds like there's not much chance of making money. However, it's also like there's a barrier right there because you got to have like at least 200 bucks to spend for each transaction to do stuff on ether to start flipping. So it's like you got to go all the way if you want to try to do flipping. I, I take it. You have to it, go all the way to ether. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's kind of like what I struggled with to begin with is I was trying to buy inexpensive NFTs because I didn't want to spend 5000 or 10000 on an NFT. So I would buy things for like 300 bucks, 500 bucks. And at that point, the gas prices weren't that crazy. I was spending like 50 to 80 bucks on, on gas fees. Now there seems to be like 150, 200. So like right off the bat, like the NFTs I was buying would have to like appreciate by 30% just for me to get my gas fees back. And, uh, and then ultimately, like, even if they changed a lot, like, okay, so they went up, they doubled in price. So you made a few hundred bucks, but it was not like, it wasn't significant, but then once you buy like things that are five grand or you know at least a full ETH and up, and you can flip them for a quarter ETH more, half ETH more, one full ETH more, whatever, then the gas fee doesn't really eat away at you. But I feel like the only success I've really had is from a projects that are already established. Um, I mean, other than minting, like if you can, you know, do your research and get into a good collection, mint something for cheap, then yeah, like that's a good, easy way to get into for a low cost and then actually make a, a good profit on it. But there's just so many projects dropping that it's kind of hard to figure out which one's going to be that one that makes it into the top 50 volume on OpenSea. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's definitely a barrier to entry because the true money to be made is like people who buy a board eight for 15 ETH and then sell it for 30, like a few months later, a couple months later. Um, so yeah, I definitely understand that aspect of it. Cause like, it's a super risky thing, but then it's hard to really actually be successful at it. In my opinion, unless you're buying successful projects that are already the one ETH and up. Um, or, or if you can catch something that you see the volume just keeps increasing, the prices keep increasing, and then you can hop onto something that is cheaper, but it's, yeah, there's a barrier to entry, I think for this, for sure. Yeah. One, one tip I would give, um, regarding minting and things like that, because a lot of minting projects now, you, you really want to be engaged on that project's discord, um, see what's kind of going on, what, what they're, what they're offering. There's a lot of kind of marketing scams that are happening now where people are just paying to kind of like they used to do on Twitter um, to kind of inflate their numbers. And it's like, oh, they've got 100,000 members on Discord, but then they can't sell out a 5,000 mint project and, and things like that. So, you know, being in, in some of the discords, um, seeing how people are engaging, if people are just like, and they're like, win Lambo, you know, and this dumb stuff, then it's like, okay, this probably isn't going to be a good project. I know for me, one of the things that I look for when I go into a discord for a new project is like how many people with blue chip uh, profile pictures are in that are in the discord. You know, if, if I go into a new project and I'm seeing a number of apes in there and I'm seeing, you know, some crypto punks or some, some Kongs or, or cool cats or gutter cats, or, you know, some of these, or even like some of the newer like creatures or doodles, it, it, it just kind of gives me a better feeling like, okay, there's some people that have been around for a while that are excited about this too. And, and that's been really helpful for me um, when it comes to minting, especially if you're able to get in early enough to get whitelisted, because then you, you typically have 24 to 48 hours uh, to mint before the public mint. So you can wait until gas is really low to do it. And so you know, uh, for me, at least, I kind of have a two prong approach, um, one where it is kind of flipping established projects um, that, you know, to your point are at one ETH or above. But then on the flip side, I kind of look at it like, you know, most projects now are minting for 0.1 or less, you know, as low as like 0.02. So, you know, I could take one ETH and essentially, you know, mint in 10 to 20 or more projects with that and so you know while a lot of those may end up being kind of losers or not doing much if i get like 
one or two mints that end up being, you know, worth, you know, half an ETH or one ETH or more, then it makes it more than worth it uh, on, on the flip side too. That's a good idea. Yeah, I like that. You know, the other thing, I, I, I like Jim's idea of, um, you know, finding out the ratio of, oh, uh, yeah. Hey, sorry guys, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to know if the, if somebody could answer the chat um, I just want to know if uh, the recording is going to be made available to, to us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. All right, cool. All right, have a good night then. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for coming. Yeah, so what I was saying was like, I like Jim's idea of like figuring out uh, the rarity versus the price, getting that ideal ratio. And like, you know, automating that uh, discovery. And if you could automate the purchase of it too, or even if it didn't happen to be automated, then you could just like have some kind of like index or ETF or something like that, or like a DAO that just all they do is just get that sweet spot of rarity to the price of the top 10 collection or, you know, whatever the a sensible number is. And then people mm -hmm. would just like own a percentage of that, a, a fraction of that, you know? Um, I don't have the skills oh, to do it, okay. but that would be like awesome. Like NFT ETF. You got it, exactly. And I like that methodology of using that ratio because, you know, that'll, that, that way you don't have to be worrying about like, oh, did it just, you know, pop because ETH is high or low or it was just some, mm -hmm. you know, interesting thing here or there. It's, I mean, it's, you're it's still going to, you're thing. still going to get uh screwed sometimes you know just because mm. like they're saying right you buy something and you list it for a fair price there's still going to be some time before someone buys it and anything can happen in that time you know well but, the, yeah i think established projects though because that that type of chart or automated process won't just work on anything because it'll spot undervalued things in a collection but if that collection has no liquidity then then it's not really that value. It just means right. other people price there is at that, and but there's no, no one's buying them. Um, so yeah, like that chart would definitely come in handy for things that are established. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the top ten, whatever on OpenSea, top ten collections or whatever, something like yep. that. Yeah, you'd have to have a pretty big wallet to automate that process, though. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. But heck, actually, something like that one might actually be uh, something that could be like a real ETF, not just like something that's like, you know, uh, one of those indexes that they have on, uh, um, you know, in, in DeFi, but like something that could actually be, you know, something that's changed on the NYSE or you know, something like that. But uh, if nothing else, it could totally work on um, things like index finance and, you know, um, token, uh, whatever that thing is. So, yeah. I don't know, just yeah, throwing it out. Cool there. idea, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, going back a little bit in the conversation. Who, who's the board ape guy? Is that his name's Mike? Or no? No, it's uh it's Boise. Boise. Boise? Boise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well Boise was saying with the whole Discord thing, because there's a lot of bots or like just how he was saying, like uh people will buy up, you know, basically to have a bunch of members. So like I was an example of this is I was part of one Discord. Uh, it was called Nonconformist Ducks, and so I thought they, they had like twelve thousand Discord members. And but I noticed that like in the Discord, it would only be like six or seven people really making conversation, which kind of was a red flag. But I ignored it. And then when it came to the minting, I thought, okay, these things are going to mint out right away. Like you got twelve thousand people fighting for these ten thousand ducks. Some people are going to like buy multiples. So like right away, I bought ten ducks as soon as minting opened up. And this was like two months ago or a month and a half ago and like they still only have maybe 2,000 minted out of their 10,000 so like clearly their discord was it was completely you know fake as far as like the true amount of members that actually joined that so looking for activity in a discord if you're looking to mint something um you know finding something that has a ton like where there's hundreds of people reacting to like the moderators or thousands of people reacting to what the moderate moderators have to say and like hundreds or thousands of, of people, unique, unique people like, you know, contributing to the, the chat, I find is like, you know, big in assessing whether or not something's gonna mint out right away. 
because it seems like there's only two types of projects. There's like ones that mint right away, like you, you barely have a chance to mint one, or there's ones that take forever to, to mint out. And then there's no real demand on the secondary market if they didn't mint right away. So, and then often I notice that if there, if it is a project that minted right away and now they're on open sea, there's going to be a lot of hype around it for the people who couldn't mint one. And so you'll see a spike in price right off the bat for the first few days, but then it'll quickly die off, you know, sometimes going down to a fourth or a fifth of the, the peak of what it did in the first week or few days. Um, so that's kind of something I'm, I take notice of if I'm, I'm trying to get a part of a project that that's just releasing or just dropping. That's cool. And, and also probably yeah, looking another... for utility, right? <laughs> what was that? And also looking for utility. Is that right? Yeah, of course, you'll go to the website, look for utility, look for the roadmap. What plans do they have to try to keep that floor price high? A lot of the things is, um, you know, that maybe they're going to come out with a free airdrop collection for anyone who's holding, uh, you know, a current NFT or it'll be that maybe they're going to take some of the funds like so say something as a five percent royalty and two and a half percent of that goes back to the the creators uh maybe they have a plan to use those funds to buy up the floor um or you know are they you know something in the discord like they'll they'll come up with creative ways basically to get people to list their their nfts at a higher price and create a higher floor price um, and then that comes, and then that's like another thing that's important that you have a strong community of people who understand that concept that aren't paper handed like the apes clearly know how to like hold and raise the value and not and anybody who was paper handing their apes, you know, got bought up by somebody who probably knows how to hold. So like kind of getting an assessment of, of how strong the community is, um, you know, has an impact on like where the project's going to go. So yeah, so I, I would just add to that uh, real quick. Um, that when when it comes to roadmaps, the the interesting thing now is it's it's you're gonna see kind of to your point, pretty much every roadmap is some form of, hey, we're gonna give a certain percentage to some sort of charity. We probably are going to use some of the funds we give back to buy up the floor. We'll give you a free airdrop, um, and then we're going to have some sort of token that comes out a little bit later that gives you some funds um, or you can make money off of. And so, you know, for me, when it comes to roadmaps, try and look for ones that are trying to do something interesting. That I mean, that still doesn't mean it's going to actually be anything, but the way I kind of explain it to a lot of people is like, if we look at traditional business, um, you know, companies would go out, they usually go through a funding round where they get some VCs or some other investors that come in really early and then they use that money and they build out, you know, a viable product. And then, you know, by the time the average person can invest in it, you know, when it when it IPOs, it's already at a, a pretty stable point where with NFTs, we're actually in that like early fund raise, you know, of these projects where we're the ones that are typically giving these projects the funds that they need to even get started with their plans and move forward. So, you know, to that end, like who's who's even behind the, the project? Do they have any experience, um, you know, completing and, and doing a project? You know, that can be really important. Um, kind of like I used to do with alts and, and other coins. It's like I do searches on Twitter, like do any, you know, are any people that are kind of respected in the space talking about some of these projects or does it seem like it's pretty much just the project talking about itself or just doing like little giveaways where it's like hey if you retweet this you'll have a chance to win a a, a free nft kind of thing like what are are people talking about it and, and i think that's really helpful to know what you know projects people in the space are really checking for yeah that's definitely a good point because the roadmaps have become almost identical to each other everyone's just promising the same future things that are going to be coming up so looking at like the development team has kind of become important because there's only a few out there that actually have people that are coming from some sort of established background and when they do come from an established background those tend to mint out like right away <laughs> which then you can kind of get a sense of how quick something might mint out based on the white list you know if they already have thousands of people whitelisted and ready to buy, then that gives you a good sense of how much demand there's going to be. 
you know, more, more so than how many Discord members they have. I would say like how many people are getting whitelisted to buy these things could show more actual like true demand for the project. But yeah, definitely if they had like the Mechaverse collection, you know, had like two artists that were from, I don't know, it was like Disney or like, you know, big names who had already worked in, in that field. And that's why I think they had so much trust uh, going into their drop. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. I have a question actually. Um, how do you, how do you just find uh, good projects that are currently minting or about to be minting? Well, so one way is that like rarity.tools or open, you will have like upcoming things. So, if, I mean, there's a lot of people that will advertise on the front page for like, you know, drops that are upcoming um mm -hmm. so it's not necessarily like okay just because they're advertising that's like a real strong sign but it's it's somewhat of a sign right because they've they've thought about the marketing and they're trying to get on the front pages of the major marketplaces so you could you know you could start with just like the upcoming or notable drops or whatever a section and kind of flip through them and then join, you know, go to their website first, see what they have to offer, then click on their Discord, see what people are saying, see what you know, what's going on with their community. Um, but I guess it's it's a lot of just like if you have friends and they're saying, hey, I checked this thing out, this looks interesting, and then you can kind of look into that. Um, does anyone else have like good ways in which they explore new collections and how they go about, I guess, narrowing that down? Well, you know, I actually, I, I don't actually do any of the trading, but I know how I see a lot of new NFT projects. Um, and that is most of the major DEXs for chains. So like each chain is like one or two specific to that chain, uh, decentralized exchange, will often have an NFT project of its own. Now, I don't know if those are going to be any value later, but they tend to stay up pretty valuable. I mean, they're usually like hundreds, thousands, thousands of dollars usually. So if you're a member of probably any Discord of any new decentralized exchange or any of the established ones also, you'll hear about their NFTs. They almost they all have an NFT, it sounds like. So that's possibly one way. I, I mean, does anybody, has anybody actually tried trading those, um, those, uh, those, those NFTs that are related to decentralized exchanges? I haven't. Does anybody have on, anything on that? Are you kind of I talking about I, like, like show you? Uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples. So like, you know, the number one um, exchange, decentralized exchange on Phantom is uh, Spooky Swap. So Spooky Swap has magic cats, right? I got to admit, they look pretty cute, right? <laughs> and so uh, I've, I've actually uh, talked to the person who, you know, who, is, who runs that thing. And, um, you know, all of them like have them. I could think of a, a couple other ones like uh, Trader Joe. That's a, probably the biggest decentralized exchange second to maybe Pangolin. I think it'd be Pangolin on Avalanche, right? They have their own uh, NFTs, you know? So, you know, if you, uh, if you just go into the discords for the major decentralized exchanges, which is what I do because I'm doing a lot of, you know, yield farming. I'm in the DeFi side. Um, you'll hear about, their NFTs, <laughs> you can't get away from it. They talk about them so much. And I look at the price of these things like Pancake Swap, Pancake Swap, they have their own NFTs too. They're selling pretty well too. So I just wonder if anybody's like flipping these, think they're a good value or not. Yeah, I actually ran into a collection. I don't know if this is related, but it was on SolanaArt.io. And one of the collections I believe was dropped by Solana Art itself. And when you purchase one of those NFTs, you get a discount on your fees when you trade uh, NFTs on Solana Art. So, and the more you have of that, it might have been the, I forget the name of the question. I guess I won't say it because I don't know, but um, I don't remember it. But basically, the more you have, the deeper of a discount you get. I think it goes up to like 50% off your fees or something like that. And it's almost a similar thing to like how Binance coin came, or Binance came out with BNB. And if you hold BNB, then you can trade on Binance with lower. 
So I think projects like that make a lot of sense because it actually is giving you a true utility towards things outside of the project itself. Um, but I don't know if that was like related or not. <laughs> like, yeah, I see stuff like that too. Like, you know, there's just recently in the last two, three days, uh, Snowball, which is like a auto compounder, mentioned that Sherpa Cash was going to give, you know, an airdrop to people who had their Sherpa Cash NFTs, you know? Um, I typically don't buy these NFTs, so I, I don't, but like, it's, it's interesting. It sounds like with decentralized exchanges, is particularly, they, um, they're looking for any kind of way that like leverage, you know, increasing funds and liquidity and whatnot. So a lot of times they do have some kind of value in the sense of like, uh, you know, like you said, you can get trades or eventually there might be some kind of airdrop related. Yeah, it definitely seems like the NFT marketplace is they're searching for utility. You know, like it's almost like you gotta, they're pulling at the fine threads to try to figure out what you could use this for. And, but I get, you know, for the most part, people are just buying them to sell them for more. I don't think anyone's really that quite interested in the NFTs themselves. But I think, I think true utility will come to the space soon enough as far as like, you know, real contracts for real uh, assets. And I think that's why play to earn is is kind of becoming more and more of a hot topic because it, it it's actually an NFT that you can utilize, you know, within a game to make more money. And, you know, you look at like an Axie where, you know, not only Axie Infinity, where not only are people able to buy the little Axie characters that they could just flip or resell, um, but they could also play the game with them, earn the in-game token, which has gone up in value quite a bit. Um, you know, you can, you, you know, I know a few people that are just breeders, um, you know, they're, where they're just breeding them together and then selling the offspring, you know, other people, they, they have kind of a real cool thing where they allow scholars to where, because, you know, it's pretty expensive now to get started in the game. So if somebody essentially buys um, the axes, they can have a scholar under them that will actually play the game for them. And then they kind of split the earnings um, for that. So, you know, I know some of the, uh, a friend of mine, he's he's up to like, I think like 20 something scholars of, of people that are just literally playing the game and they're doing 50-50 splits on all the back end earnings. So, you know, thing, things like that, I think are going to be the next phase. But to your point, I think, you know, NFTs are, are going to kind of leak into every aspect of our lives from, you know, everything from like our, our IDs um, to, you know, deeds to our houses to, you know, um, our, our vehicle um, titles, uh, pretty much everything I think will be end up being an NFT, um, you know, in five to 10 years. Yeah, I agree with that. That's crazy. It's funny, I just bought a, a new car a Benz, and I was just laughing that like in the future, uh, my grandkids will make fun of me that I have a car that actually uses a gasoline powered engine. No, they'll be making right, fun. or even that I even drive my own car, right? <laughs> yeah, I definitely think major purchases will be done on NFTs eventually, so that it's an actual verified contract that's not going anywhere, can't be changed by any authority or whatever. Yeah, like think about when we buy houses and essentially we have to go through a, a closing agent who is going to kind of check the history of the of the deed of the house um, and then act as kind of escrow when you're selling the house so that, you know, they'll they'll transfer the deed to the escrow company. Then once the bank or whoever sends the money in, then they'll kind of do the exchange. And, and the reality is, is smart contracts and the fact that you can see the full history of an NFT right on the blockchain is just going to streamline a lot of these things um, significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but my question is though, like I've, I've heard of this for a while and one of the things I wanted to do was really get into the whole physical assets associated with NFTs thing. Like I'm an artist, I wanted to make my, my drawings into NFTs and then sell the, the, uh, the physical drawing as well with it, right? But, you know, I don't think that's really working. And, and I mean, the idea has been around for at least a few years now. And I don't know what the, uh, the hesitancy is for it. Um, but as it, 
in particular that part has anybody heard about like you know art as a physical asset um being sold along with the nft it's like hey i sell you the nft now if you want i'll give you the actual physical piece of art that i that i use to make this jpeg yeah I've, I've, I've actually heard of that um happening um quite a bit i think that there, there's two issues with it though so i think people like it from a standpoint of um you know if i buy this nft i could potentially get you know whether it's the real artwork or a print of the artwork um but i think where there's a challenge that comes in is if you have let's say a physical piece that you want to be kind of uh, nft so to speak and the digital piece if they're supposed to connect to each other at at a certain point how do they connect like i can easily just post a digital nft on OpenSea and sell it but if i sold that you know how would the new buyer ensure that they're going to get the physical piece or that you have that so that's that's one of the bigger challenges but we've seen some um we've seen some cool use cases of that like um i think his name is damien hertz um who did the yeah. currency project where you know it's like ten thousand digital nfts that he put out but that are like images of real art that he's created and then after 12 months he's allowing everybody to decide whether they want to keep the digital nft or they want to get a physical of it and for anybody that wants the physical they're going to have to burn their digital nft to get the physical painting um and so you know in a year it's going to be the the digital nft is going to become deflationary because some percentage is going to burn them and you know obviously game theory comes in there which you know which might be more valuable or more rare at that point in time but you know i, I think that was a really creative way to kind of do both both things yeah i remember hearing about that i mean you know damien hurst he like sold like you know a diamond encrusted skull for like 60 million or something like that those uh those paper nft things or whatever whereas where it's, you can either have the nft or you can burn it those are for like two grand each which isn't you know slouch it's not small but um you know damien hearst is huge as far as modern artists go so you know it and that's about as big a use case as i've seen hmm. Yeah, I somewhat, yeah. I purchased an NFT that kind of was along the lines of this. It was Shakira was least releasing a, a collection and it was like the, the NFT creator was called Boss Logic, but obviously Boss Logic like contacted Shakira and tried to do a, a collaboration. So she was like actually behind it. And when you bought the NFTs, um, you get the same picture that the NFT is, but then you get a physical proof where Shakira signs it. So I had bought the NFTs just solely for the purpose of getting the, the actual images signed by her, uh, sent to, to me in the mail, but that definitely gets tricky if you're trying to connect like physical assets with the NFT thing, because you have to trust that you're going like that the physical thing you're receiving is in fact, what they're saying they're going to give you, you know, like that, that in itself has to be like vetted in some way. Whereas when you're only trading digital content, like that all the vetting is done right there on the blockchain. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they kind of sort that issue out of like verifying physical assets through an NFT contract. Cause like technically you don't really even need to have any picture or anything associated with that NFT, it could just be a contract for that asset, for the physical asset purchase. But then you're kind of running into the issue of how do you know that you're actually gonna get that physical asset and that it is legit. So it'll be interesting well, to see like how they kind of sort that issue out with time. Well, the, the, the second part they've already, I saw this cause I was like, I was looking into it. That second part they're kind of working on already, the whole like making sure that's legit where they put like an RFID tag in there and you okay. scan it. And then you could say that it is indeed the one that's related to this uh, smart contract. But the first part, you're right. You know, you bought it. How do you know you're going to get it? The uh, the physical asset along with it. You know that, mm -hmm. that 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 part. I don't know. And that's the thing. If you're if you're minting it and it's like you're expected to get it from the creator, Damien Hurst or someone, then I feel like it's it's probably pretty likely to happen unless the project right. totally falls apart. Well, exactly. Know? But for, if it's just on the secondary market, you know, like someone buys it 
and then they sell it and they just don't send them the physical thing. But that's exactly. what I'm literally running into right now is I bought those NFTs and I was never contacted any further about how I'm getting these physical proofs. So I had to then call up, like there's no one to call on OpenSea. Like I sent them emails, but I don't get anything back. So I ultimately had to call my credit card company and and get the the charges reversed it was on maker's place so i could actually like buy the nft with a- <laughs> so you just got them reverted because you couldn't figure out <laughs> I, well they, I, they gave me all my money back and i still have the nfts but i don't have <laughs> i don't have the physical proof so like clearly there's an issue with how this thing whole works out because like who do you contact when you don't get your i mean money? i feel like that's the the project itself right the discord channel or the people organizing it yeah, and I don't, and I don't know what happens in that case, like when you've transferred crypto, because it's not like you can just call up Ethereum and get your money back. So yeah, and that's the tough thing about having, you know, important things like your house. You know, like the blockchain is very uh, no refunds, no takebacks. You know, if you forget your password, it's like, <laughs> but your house just has to be foreclosed, and no one can use that land ever because it's in a wallet. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be another interesting case, right? <laughs> yeah. So has anyone considered like making their own NFT collection? I have one, but I haven't sold a damn one. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Let's check it out. <laughs> Oh, if you're on OpenSea right now, you can just go to uh, look for obvious, A-W-B-V-I-O-U-S, like my, my username. Let's by the way, do it slower. And what was it? Okay, so like the word obvious, but with an A-W instead of a no. A-W-B-V-I-O-U-S. Oh, wait, A-W? Okay. Yeah. There you go. That's me at the top right there. Wait, how'd you get that name? Oh, uh, it's my initials is the first four of it and then you know i used it for like all kinds of arts and stuff yeah, see yeah. i got the ens cool. <laughs> the um ens drop but since i didn't make my uh my dedicated i got like half the airdrop it's kind of lame but so these are some of the like lame things that i've been trying to do but if you scroll down there's some more like actual art um that was actually part of a a, a contest for x token and um i didn't actually make it then i tried to make like crypto punks uh crypto promorphics which is those icons right there um but you know i didn't sell one if i was gonna sell one i was gonna sell more that right there this is crypto y'all is a uh first crypto fiction i think you know was, i wrote it on um which chain was it, it was uh, uh not steam but hive hive and it was about Kind of about Justin's son, honestly. Um, and so, you know, I figured, hey, I'll make it into an NFT itself. Um, <laughs> I haven't sold it yet <laughs> uh, because it is oh. exact. The reason why I did it for yeah, one million. Yeah, it's a little high. Yeah, the reason why <laughs> right. I did it for a one million though. Was, high <laughs> was because Justin's son opened up his own NFT collection where the minimum was going to be one million. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to shoot for the stars here. You know I mean? Like it's about Justin's son. You know, he might be like, Ooh, it's about me. I mean, kind of, not exactly, you know, maybe, maybe I could sell it. And so, but I haven't. <laughs> maybe someone with a big wallet will misclick. <laughs> yeah. You never know. Right. You never know. Um, but yeah, so everything here I put down for like one ETH um, and there should be a lot more. Most of them are actually my actual drawings. If you scroll down uh, and what I did is I, you know, scan them, and then I turn them into PNGs or SFGs, um, you know, vector drawings. Uh, I don't know. Does it scroll down any further? It, it well, Yeah, it's not letting me scroll down any further than this. Ah, that's weird. Um, yeah. yeah. You got to make them all one ETH, and then just one of them make it 0.5 ETH, and then Jim's automated program will pick up the discrepancy and automatically <laughs> purchase it for you. <laughs> yeah, except for I am like probably ranked 1 million on the list. You know? So um, maybe if you put in like the word uh, sketch zero up top, because that's the collection. Sketch zero. zero. Yeah. Um, is there a space or no space? No, no space. Uh, no space, zero space. So no space. It should be right next to it. It's the one right below it, where it says eighty-two items, oh. right below it. that one. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So these are my drawings, and I did them as both uh, like PNG 
and SFG. So if you look at the SFG ones, what I did is I, I, I scanned them, I then uh, vectorized them. So that way, when you zoom in, you know, you don't get all pixelated, right? Okay. So, yeah. And like, I'm trying to, I tried also to, to, to um, what do you call it? To bundle them so you could get both the SFG and the PNG together for like 1.5 as opposed to each one individually for one. I, cool. I, I spent you spent some time doing this. And sorry, did you one. say how did you actually mint it? Did you make a smart contract or use like Rarible or something? No, no. So what I did is I just went through and uploaded them onto OpenSea. So these are those. Um, oh, right. Yeah, OpenSea. Oh, and the create yeah. button. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those are free, you know. Uh, so you <laughs> all these What's that? You just you do you sketch all these on a computer or on like paper first or how do you how do you right. Create? So what I did is I, I sketched it first on paper. Then I took uh, pictures or scanned them. Actually, I did pictures. I should have scanned them. Um, and then what I did is I took Photoshop. I got rid of all the, the shadows. So it's just black and white. And then because there's shadows that happens when you take pictures, then I vectorized them. So the ones that say SFG, they are vectorized, which means that um, they're not going to be all little pixels. You can, you can zoom in on them. Yeah. But uh, yeah. These were all hand drawn on paper first. Yeah. I like these women one. You draw some good female models. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, the, if I'm going to draw something, I'm going to draw something that I'm interested in, right? <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you might Can I ask you, do you have any following like for your art, like nope. just outside of NFC? So, you know, with that being said, I would say, you know, and, and I actually like a lot of your pieces um, from you some some are a little quirky to me but I, I do like a number of them but I, I think you're just kind of priced a bit high to start right. or if you are priced this high like you really you know I think and, and I've talked to a number of artists that are in similar boats where it's just kind of like hey I made this art I posted it why isn't it selling and, and the reality is is like that's kind of the first step but then mm -hmm. it's like what are you doing to kind of promote yourself and the, and the products you know there's there's hundreds of thousands probably millions of nfts on OpenSea right now so you know mm -hmm. are you are you on twitter are you on social media do you have a discord where you're trying to kind of build up a group um that kind of understands where you're coming from where you can kind of talk more directly to your potential you know following around like what your your real thought process was and why these have more meaning than potentially just you know what we're seeing and getting like a core following that can right. start buying and promoting it um to other people but you know it, you, you, it so I, I think you you just need to do more work to kind of promote it and then also like and and, and i hate to say this because i i do feel like art is art right but i think in the current state of nfts there is a lot of kind of like what is the utility and so exactly. you know obviously mm -hmm. you know with with certain art there isn't necessarily a utility but what i have seen like artists do as a utility for their art is maybe where it's like hey the utility of you owning one of my pieces is that you know when i do anytime i do a new drop you guys will be white listed to be able to buy it first mm. before anybody else out there or you know That's what for people that have already bought my art like once every few months or once a month or something like that i'll airdrop a piece you know to you know the people that have bought my art or randomly to you know the people that have bought my art so it's it's almost like hey i believe in your art now i've i've, I've kind of spoken with my dollars and now you really taking care of that core group and, mm -hmm. and kind of building from there. So, you know, just just a couple of thoughts. Oh, no, those are good. Those are very good. In fact, that's like if uh, in the chat earlier, I was asking like, where are some, what are some good no code um, solutions for uh, utility, you know? And, and I got some good links in there like mintgate.io, unlock protocol, collab.land, guild.xyz. And I've, I've seen collab.land a lot on Discord. So, you know, I totally agree with you because I am as more skeptical than anyone about NFTs without, you know, utility. So yeah, I'm gonna try to figure out some way to actually make some utility for these because until then, you know, I don't even feel comfortable trying to hawk them, you know? I gotta give them some kind of value for sure, agreed. Yeah, there's an artist named um, 
Dario, I think his last name is Desana. Um, mm. And um, I, I would say, check him out. He, he's an artist and he has a Discord. And I think he's been one of the, the best when it comes to exactly what I was talking about in terms of like building out his Discord. He does he does giveaways on a regular basis. He's really interactive with, you know, both people that have purchased his art and then just other people that are just in the Discord that may have seen his art or interacted with different things. He even like offers to do things like if if people own different blue chip pro projects where he'll kind of put his own spin and do a derivative of them, like kind of in his art style mm -hmm. and, and just a number of things to just really engage with you know, his audience. And I, and I think that's really the big thing as, as an artist, you know, whatever the medium, you know, whether you're in the real world or digitally, it's like, you know, getting the art out there where enough people see it and, and can resonate with it and, 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 you know, kind of connect to you to want to put their dollars where, where, you know, um, kind of their, their interest lies. Oh yeah. I went to um, an actual in real life event for NFTs <clears throat> and people, creators and whatnot, it was a panel with, with like a couple of people who had, you know, done pretty well in, in the space. And I asked like how much of it is, you know, going out there and like pretty much, you know, uh, not hawking your stuff, but like, you know, touting your stuff and uh, promoting your stuff. They said a lot of it is, you know, it really is. And uh, I'm not somebody who likes to do that, but um, I, I know that's definitely necessary. And I like the fact that like with utility, I'm hoping if I can make the utility, then I don't have to do that <laughs> as much. Where like, I'm like, oh yeah, this stuff is great. You know, why aren't you guys buying it? I, I don't know. I mean, another big part of it I found out from being at these uh, NFT vaults in, in real life is that a lot of these artists get further by buying from each other, you know? That like buy, like, oh, I'll buy yours, you buy mine, you know? And then it creates a kind of liquidity that didn't exist before. Um, and I wouldn't also feel comfortable about doing that either, but it's very interesting. There are some definite ways to get in, in the space. Just to chip in at this, what you just said, it also creates provenance. So if you have a guy who on the record paid a million dollars for your stuff, you can point to that and it creates a market. Yeah, Implicit. absolutely. Yeah. Trust and momentum. I feel like if you can create momentum, whether that's people inside buying it up and creating a, a perspective demand or, um, yeah, it, it's definitely like a matter of like, so Gary V has a collection. I don't know if you guys have seen, it, it's called V friends and he, he does like really elementary sketches. Uh, it must take him like 20 seconds or less to do each sketch, but because he has a platform, he has a social media presence. He's able to sell them just simply because of who he is. But for artists who aren't well known and they're trying to to release a collection, like it's it's got to either be utility or some sort of momentum. People are seeing that people are buying them. They see that demand. They see the prices going up, and then they buy one for that purpose. <clears throat> Was Gary V that guy who was able to sell like his doodle on uh, Sotheby's? Most likely, they're like little doodles, and he's he's the whole like YouTube inspirational type of speakers. That's like just basically telling like you know buy my course and I'll teach you how to be successful type. So he's like a Grant Cardone or uh, you know any of those YouTube inspirational success people. Yeah, yeah, I could I couldn't do that either. <laughs> mm. Hey, Mike, you want to look up the uh, Silly Squares? Oh, yeah. Shameless plug. <laughs> That's it. All right, well, let me see if I can. So what comes up, actually, it's kind of funny, right? Silly Squares, if you click on that first one, right? This one actually is not mine. This is just some other random one that was called Silly Squares. Just these weird, like, rectangle box randomness things. See how but then the second one, someone listed, <laughs> wait. If you search for it again, Wait, dude, Silly dude. Squares NFT comes up as number two, and it's just this collection with zero items. I don't know why this is ahead of mine. But that's not you, right? You're no. These two. Um, yeah. So oh. that first one, Silly Squares Club. If you click on that one, this one has a uh, two fifty maximum, and this one, right? Like I said, um, I'm a coder, really not exactly an artist but i did use sketch and like make these 
if you scroll down yeah and it was kind of just an example of like how do you do this uh put it out on OpenSea, right these are on polygon actually so you can see it here when you're on mainnet OpenSea, but it's super cheap to send them to each other or list them and buy them so and I'm then so this one was a 250 max because i used just the free account of pinata what i used to like host the files in ipfs and um yeah, we have a Discord channel for it too. I even made this little website where like if you're if you have a silly square in your wallet and you have MetaMask connected, then you can see this like exclusive content, which is kind of just this picture of a zebra, but uh in theory, you know, it could expand to lots of cool things. Maybe you could add the utility of like you got a yeah, the hoodie. I got these hoodies. Sorry, can I still have some value? I'm thinking um, if you create an OnlyFans and then that's like you own that, <laughs> you get a free membership yep. in OnlyFans. I feel like that could be some pretty good uh, utility. Mm -hmm. And so if you click on one, right, I use like the hash lips uh, engine to like make this. Oh, wait, wait. So it has, like, if you click on any one of these, right, just to see that it has the properties uh like hat oh. is whatever leprechaun hat or something yeah and you used did you use a randomizer for these to like generate these images or yeah so it's like it's the hash lips algorithm it's this uh thing on github and the guy's youtube account and you basically set the rarities yourself i want the rarity of leprechaun hat to be you know, it's kind of like you set it to be an integer, right? The lower is more rare. So you can set it to one, that's super rare. Or you can set it to 20, you know, that's less rare. Or 100 is like more common, right? And you kind of run it through the algorithm and then it generates, like you add that in the name of each individual thing, right? So you would export that leprechaun hat just on its own with a transparent background right and then that rarity for it and it kind of mashes everything together and uses the weights that you set in your rarities in order to make them actually that rare yeah so like one thing i do for rarity if it's not on rarity.tools and i want to kind of like assume it's rarity then you can search through the properties on OpenSea and the things that are going to have the lowest available um like say you go into body gear and you find something that has only like 93 you know so something that has a property value of 93 will always be more rare than you know something that has a property of 95 or even if you go into a different section like maybe there's something lower than 95 on something else let me see well most of these don't i'm trying to find something but anyway, if, so, if, if, if any item has a property that say only there's 50 of and another one has a bunch of rare properties, but they don't, but it's not as low as 50, then they won't be as rare as that one. So you could have like a bunch of stuff that's like 182 and then in this other property, you know, another rare one. But if a single item has something with only 30 of them in it then it's always going to be more rare than than something that has a combination of somewhat rare properties but it wasn't a single property that was more rare than that one if that makes any sense yeah the tip there too is um i always quickly try and look for things that are only on certain nfts so in this case with the lazy lion like only some of them have earrings and only some of them have something on the top of their head so that's like a really quick way that you could like just go to those two properties and you know kind of narrow it down to say hey i want something that has an earring and something on top of its head and that's probably going to be in you know the the upper tier in terms of rarity just because of those two things and so that's actually a way that i before things hit rarity rarity tools and kind of try and snipe um for rare um nfts like when they first mint if i'm not able to mint and and or if it's uh they get revealed let's say a few days after the mints like right 
I'll, I'll try and like jump in as quickly as possible and, and kind of look for those kind of more more rare traits and, and and buy them if there's like if they seem really cheap in comparison yeah so so if you notice on lazy lions there's no section under properties to uh, sort by how many properties they have but if you go on rarity.tools you can see they do have a trait count and everything that only has five traits is like one of the most rare because everything else has more than that so you can see that if you pick a five trait lion, this is actually one of the ones I picked up. Um, like you can see that the, the the floor price is seven and a half ETH, and it had nothing to do with any particular like property in a trade. It just has to do with that it had less traits than the others. And not all collections will will have like a rarity based on that, but but Lazy Lions does. And when you're on OpenSea, you can't actually do that. So yeah, that's a Another way to kind of assess its rarity is to see how many traits it has compared to other NFTs in that same collection. Yeah, when and when it comes to traits, usually either the lowest amount of traits or the highest amount of traits are the most rare. Yeah. Um, and and it and it definitely depends on the collection because on this one, it's it's one of the the five traits are the rarest, um, but then other collections. You know, they might have like uh, nine traits might be the rarest. Like I know in gutter cat gang, the nine trait cats are the are the rarest out of those. So yeah. So when I bought into it was, it was on the Solana network and it was called Soul Yetis. They didn't have a rarity tool for it yet. So I went and picked up the lowest trait uh, Yetis that they had. And then when the rarity tool came out, it turned out that like anything with the really low traits was like ranked really bad, like 9,000 to 10,000 basically rank range. So like in that case, I got screwed because I went and bought like the really low trait Yetis. But then when the, the rarity tool came out, it didn't take that into account at all. Um, so there's kind of, yeah, until the rarity tool comes out, it sometimes can be hit or miss whether that the trait count actually takes effect. But for lions, it does. You got anything else for us, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, you're calling me James, man. And it shows like how long you've known me, right? Nobody even calls me James anymore. It's sad. Um, I guess I'm just, you know, other people call you Jim, so I figured <laughs> I'd create a standard and stick with it. No, it's all good. You guys can call me Bob if you want to. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean it's getting pretty late. This was awesome though. Yeah, this was thanks, great, guys. definitely. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for coming out and Boise, obvious. Thanks. Everybody, Ken and everybody for hosting. Yeah, thanks, guys.